What's up, Brent? How are you doing? Hi, Doug. I'm all right. How are you? Not bad. I don't know if you know this, but I chopped the tip of my finger off the other day. How did that happen? <laughs> well, know, well, I was eating some Louisville vegan jerky and uh, <laughs> uh, some story about that. Um, funny you say that because they are our sponsor, but no, that's, um, that has nothing to do with it. I was, I was chopping some spinach actually. And I described this on my Patreon to my Patreon followers. I told them the whole story, but I'll repeat it here. Patreon.com slash Doug Pound if you want to support me there. And by the way, I just released a new rap song on there. But, and I released the remix of The Office Hours Sitting Up, Standing Down featuring Tim Heidecker on there. But I was chopping spinach and people say, why do you chop spinach? And it's because when I make a salad, I want the salad to be like, a bowl of cereal where each scoop is a bunch of small bits, you know? Uh -huh. So I chop, I chop it all up so I can basically eat a salad with a spoon if I wanted to. And I got my knives sharpened at the, at the farmer's market. There's a knife sharpening guy. He made them really sharp. And I think I was probably thinking about the pound cast. I was probably thinking about patreon.com slash pound cast, you know? <laughs> and I it wasn't you, thinking I was chopping and chopping and then well, it got you kind of excited too. I got, I got really excited about, about our Patreon and I was chopping and chopping and boom, took the toll, took the tip off with part of the nail and all. It was pretty oh gross. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. yeah. So I picked up the the piece and I put it back on and oh I, go, I wrapped it up with gauze and I ran down to the emergency room. I didn't go to the emergency room. I didn't want to clog that up. I went to urgent care, which is sort of like emergency room light, you know? I wasn't like at death's door. But the, the gauze was all filled up with it was it was wait oh my with god. Blood. You it was all bloody. Yourself? Yeah, I just drove myself all the way over to Pasadena. Anyway. Oh my god. Sir, oh my god, that is really just horrifying. Were you horrified? No, I'm like, well, that happened. Did they put the tip back on or is that gone? So I cleaned it off pretty good. I put the tip back on. I gauzed it. The doctor, she looked at it. She unwrapped it. And she's like, oh, you know, you did a pretty good job. And you know what she did? She glued it back on. By uh, really? they, they cover your finger. They cover the whole thing in super glue, like a super glue kind of glue. Yeah. And that just puts like a big, like shell, you know, like magic shell from my, the ice cream topping. It hardens yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. It hardens in a little, in a few okay, seconds. Okay, so they put some shell on it. Yeah. They put a big shell on it, and that hardened in a few seconds. And and then she kind of taped it up, and she said, "Yeah, just let it kind of naturally fall off when it falls off," you know. So and then she goes, "You know what she said to me? She goes, what?" She's like, you're all actually the, that ex, that hospital experience was the easiest, like hospital experience, doctor experience I've ever had. I was in and out in 10 minutes. It was, it was wild. Wow. You would think that these hospitals are jammed with like COVID patients, but it ain't like that. I don't want to get into a conspiracy about the COVID thing, but there was no one there. So anyway, she's like, what's that smell? And I like on my way there, I was driving with one hand and I was also dipping in, in, in dipping into my Louisville vegan uh, jerky, <laughs> smoky Carolina barbecue. She's like, what is that smell? Before you go, you got to tell me what your, your breath sm smells delicious. And, you know, I said, well, it's, it's the smoky Carolina barbecue from Louisville vegan jerky. They happen to be the sponsor of our pound cast. She's like, wait, you do the pound cast with Brent? I was like, yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, I love that guy. He does the gangster party line. And then she started saying all this <laughs> stuff that you, doc, you wouldn't want a doctor to hear, to say, you know? She was quoting from the, from the gangster party line. <laughs> right, right. And then she was like, he also did that one squeeze where those big buff guys and the turd comes out. And I was like, yeah. 
She's like, she's that's like, why I got but, into medical school. And then she's like, that got me into the medical profession. I said, that's not possible. And I said, like, look, I know you want to know about this jerky. So if you go to louisvilleveganfoods.com, you can support Brent and you can support me and you can support the podcast and you can have one of the most delicious snacks out there. And if you're looking for vegan snacks, this is the top. This is the top one right here. And they support the Poundcast. And you could support us, support them. Go to louisvilleveganfoods.com. You know what I told her? I said, if you go there and use the code word Poundcast, you can get 20% off your entire order. And she goes, she's like, well, as you know, I'm a doctor. I get paid pretty well. But I'm going to take advantage of that 20% off. What's the code word again? I said Poundcast. Poundcast. And she's like, what are you doing later? I'm like, I'm going to be back home, like waiting for my finger to heal. She's like, well, your other finger, finger works, right? I'm like, what are you getting at, doc? And she goes, maybe we can hang out and you can point at stuff with me. We, we can point at louisvillevegandfoods.com. We can point at bricks beautiful sites and bricks we can point at bricks you know we can point out beautiful things that are surrounding our areas well this doctor look brent this doctor was warm for my form you know what i mean okay i said doc we have to keep this on a professional level I, i understand the louisville vegan jerky did something it unlocked some kind of primal passion passion within your olfactory mind but and you are the most beautiful doctor i've ever seen (laughs) that's what right that's true brent and i said but i you know i'm it ain't like that you know this is a doctor patient situation i said i got no patience for this and she's (laughs) like all right i tried she's like i i took i took a swing and a miss you know and i was like you know, I'm flattered, but look, just go to louisvilleveganfoods.com, use the code word poundcast. And she goes, let me guess, get 20% off. I said, yeah. Well, look, so that's what happened. That's a, I mean, look, I, I, look, I want to delve more into this finger story because I want to know what was real and what's not about what you just said. But we'll do that when we have our guest in. But before we get our, to our guests, let me just mention real quick that um, if you do want to um, see if you want extended content uh, for the Poundcast, you can go to the page. You can go to www.patreon.com slash Poundcast. And there's extended episodes. There's uh, uh, extended, there's other stuff on there too. Each it's episode, mainly, it's mainly, each it's mainly episode. Extended. Yeah. Each episode we go, we, when, when this, when this main episode ends, we keep going and we go after dark. And sometimes it's, twice as you know sometimes it's double the episode most of the time a lot of the time okay and you know for as little as two bucks a month you know it's basically like throw us a tip if you like our show throw us a tip get on patreon.com slash poundcast and you know what i got pound i got a few poundcast t-shirts left these are 10 bucks each i'm basically giving them away big cartel doug pound dot big cartel dot com you can get the poundcast t-shirt and this is good quality cotton and I'm pretty 10 bucks. I think shipping might even be included. It's great. The, the sales, the, the savings are unbelievable here. All right. Wow. That's a, that's a real, wow. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. Well, listen, and then the other thing real quick is that we are on video now. If you want to, there's the youtube.com slash the pound cast. If you want to uh, check that out, and um there's also an instagram uh account that is instagram.com slash or whatever i don't know how you do it on your phone but anyway it's the Poundcast, right and um i think on there is where we'll be having some of the basketball remix videos posted that um some of the uh users not users um the um some of the the patrons and subscribers patron subscribers uh did so we'll be posting those there and there's been some really cool ones some really yeah because cool we uh we released all the footage that we shot for our basketball videos i put all of it available for the patreon subscribers and they've been uh 
and re re editing. And they also re they also re, re remixed our theme song because I put the stems for the theme song up, and we're about to play one. In one but, of those. And one last thing I'll just mention is September nineteenth. Uh, I have a sort of video game comedy show that I'm going to do. It's Saturday, and it is at it's from seven p.m. to nine p.m. and it's Basically, it's Brent Weinbach plays Nintendo Live. We'll be playing the video game Mega Man, the original Mega Man on Nintendo. And my uh, co-host for my other podcast, Legacy Music Hour, will be doing commentary along with me while we play it. And uh, his name is Rob, uh, Rob F. Switch. And uh, yeah, that's that's will be a Zoom show. So you'll get the link to the Zoom meeting. Um, but if you go to my Instagram account, which is Brent Weinbach Comedy, there's a link to that and um, that might be a fun thing to do. All right, now, cool. Let's so, should we get into it, Brent with, um, yeah. go, let's with, go ahead with our guest, with our Vera guest. Drew. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you bring on Vera and I'm going to play this podcast intro remix three okay. stooges chill beat to relax to mix by Parker Rice. One of our Patreon subscribers. Let's let it rip. Oh, company probably got their wires all tangled up. Go on up and straighten out the mess. Ah, ah, wait a minute. What am I doing? You know I get dizzy in high places. You're dizzy in low places. Get up Welcome there. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Gee, did it hurt? No. Does this? Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. All right, that is the Poundcast intro. Three Stooges Chill Beat to Relax to Remix. Welcome to the Poundcast. By, I believe that's by Parker Rice, Parker. one of our Patreon subscribers. Parker Rice can't lose. That's right. That's a pretty chill mix. I like that. It's very, as you would say, chill. It's Three Stooges, but you can relax to it. You know, I like that. And we'll we'll play the whole thing at the end. I mean, you've never you've never heard the Three Stooges like that before. You never heard the Stooges like that before. Definitely not in like a, a chill, relaxing setting. They're usually pretty manic. <laughs> they are. They are often manic. They could be called the manic, stu the the manic stooges. Well, Vera, thank you for uh, welcome to the Poundcast. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you Vera, for having me. Vera Drew is our guest, and uh... Vera Drew. Let's do a quick introduction. Vera Drew. A, you may know her work from I Love David, uh, the Tim and Eric quiz, Scum, Our Bodies. These are all um, shows on Channel 5, which is the Tim and Eric's, Tim and Eric's sort of like streaming network channel on Adult Swim. And you also... We're an editor on Who is America? Did you win an Emmy for that? I was nominated for an Emmy. Um, Emmy nominated editor Vera Drew. Congratulations for, on that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. This time last year, I was getting ready to go, go to the Emmys. And now I'm working out of an apartment with a Snow White tapestry. <laughs> well, now that, now the Emmys are going to come to you. They're, yes, they're that's go to it. you. Yeah, you know? that's yeah. how they do it these days. <laughs> Are they doing the Emmys now? Is it Emmys season right now? I think so. I think they. I think they're doing um, daytime. I know. I know they're like streaming. Um, they're streaming it this year. I don't think any sort of like actual event is happening. I don't think I've ever been. I think I was in a four-year consideration. <laughs> <laughs> But most of the shows I work on are like adult swim shows, which are like 15 minute shows. And those are, those are not, um, whatever. They don't qualify to be an Emmy. 
Not, which is sad, you know. I guess only a, a a show, a half an hour show. Those are both shows are shows. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no matter the length. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I mean, like, I probably would have never. I shouldn't say that. I mean, maybe I would have ended up there someday, but definitely the point. I was at in my career when I was nominated like the only reason I got nominated was because I was working on that show like there was a lot of prestige attached to it when it was when it was airing and it's like I don't know it was like cool to be nominated and it was like cool to go to the ceremony and like it was really I think the best part was like dressing up and there was like a lot of good food there was weird like interpretive dancers at the after party but like for the most part it's really fucking boring and i i didn't realize how much i wanted to win until i didn't win oh uh, were there, was a, there lot, a camera many? on you and it was like you know the nominees are <laughs> yeah and i was like fuck you, yeah no i you, there, oh, how many on. editors were there i think in our category, there were like six of us, but there were definitely more than six editors that worked on that show. I uh -huh. think and I think six was of the us camera were. was the camera on all six of you, you know, kind of bunched up, you know. So one, that was one screen. No, I'm just <laughs> that was the, yeah, it was like a Zoom call. Yeah. They didn't. I mean, it was like also the thing that people don't realize is they they have three different ceremonies. I mean, you guys probably know this because you your industry hot shots, but they have three different ceremonies. And two of them are, I don't think are televised or are like on FXX or something weird. Um, so even like the show, like the production value of it, like felt kind of like high school theater -y. Like it was very, there was like one big opening dance number, no cameras in the audience. That's all to say. Are you having, did you do a lot of sessions with Sasha Baron Cohen or was it mainly with people like, I don't know, Dan Longino and stuff, or what, what, you know? It was like, I mean, I mean how, very hands-on. Like, he, yeah. he, like, I, I, I was in the room with him, especially after they were done filming, because I was on that for, like, a year, oh, my God, like, over a year. It was, like, over a year of my life, and, uh, like, after they were, while they were filming, he would pop in, for like note sessions and stuff but once they were like done and like it was time to start delivering the show he was in my room uh working working with me he's very very hands-on got in it post. yeah wow was he um pretty was it a, a different experience working with him compared to other people um yeah i mean like i i qualify all of this with like he is honestly one of he's one of the best bosses I've ever had like he was so so nice and like even on like a personal level because my, my grandfather passed away while I was working on that show and I was really close to him and Sasha because I when bad stuff happens to me I just like dissociate and tune out um so I was still like going into work and he took me aside and was like you know you really shouldn't be here you should like go home and and grieve and that always stuck out to me as something like he didn't have to do that. Like I, I was totally willing to like keep working. Um, so he was like a really nice guy to work with just like interpersonally, but he's like, you know, he's very, he's intense. Like, I mean, I would not apply this label to somebody if I didn't actually feel this way. Like he's a literal genius and like thinks of things in a very specific way, has a very clear vision and um will work with you until until that vision's realized i mean he like having said that by the end since i was on for so long it was getting it got easier as time passed like it does with anybody just because i knew what he wanted at that point so he's pretty particular yeah but he's you know but he's also like super open to ideas i mean like part of like the joke when i was working on it was always that like I was the resident millennial or whatever <laughs> which is like like normally would drive me nuts but like it kind of it was to him an empowering label because I think 
you know, I grew up with his stuff. I was such a huge fan of him and he knew that. Um, but I was coming at it from a different perspective. Cause like a lot of the other people that were working on that show were like industry veterans or weren't even like from TV. There was like a lot of uh, film people, like his entire production team. I don't, I don't even think was, were, were TV people at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, I think he really valued my opinion just because of, of where I came from, like having worked with Tim and Eric and stuff and being known as like an underrated alternative comedy editor, I think was kind of cool in his eyes. And he's very, very open to input. So um, you, I, I was watching this show, I Love David. And yeah. so let's talk about that a little bit. So David, that show is, is David Liebehart's um, show. And from what, you know, all the buzz around it is that they let David do whatever he want. He wanted to do for his show. <laughs> he do whatever he want. <laughs> he, he do whatever he want. Yeah. So how did that show, <laughs> what happened with that? How did that show come about and what, what's up with that? And isn't it I heart? Wouldn't it be I heart David? You know, you, you can call it that if you'd like. I, I, I always say I love David, but but it's like it could be called I heart David, spelled H A R T or whatever, however you spell his last name. Well, oh, that's true. Well, let me ask you this: Do you say I heart Lucy? Well, no, I'm just saying because his last name is Hart. Oh, I one, see. One well, of his I... <laughs> one of his many many names is yeah, Hart. Yeah, I guess I just lost track of of all all of his all of his names. Um, I mean, the way that worked was I got hired by Tim and Eric to do four shows for that network you mentioned, the Channel 5. And um, yeah, the first, <laughs> like the, f the first day I met with them, they told me they wanted me to direct and produce a show for David Liebehart, and we had to let him do whatever he wanted. And when I heard that, I was... It was honestly, of all four shows, it was the one I was dreading the most, just because, I mean, Doug, you've, you know David. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, that's what I want to know. Like, how did, you, how did you not go insane? I, I, I mean, do... I, I kind of did. <laughs> I think I kind of did. I mean, like, I went into it, so I went into it, like, thinking, basically, because, like, the thing, I've known David for as long as I've worked with Tim and Eric, which is about seven or eight years at this point and I know he's like like tells really wild stories and like claims to have met Robin Williams and and like you know he he was abducted by aliens like he's a he's a very outlandish dude like the first thing I committed to myself when I started working on it was like I'm going to believe everything he says the show will be on his side and will also believe everything he says because this is his show. And I think that comedy will shine through. And I just had, I had like breakfast with him like that first day um, and was like, what kind of show would you want to do? And he literally, I mean, he pitched me like 20 shows, like, <laughs> like so many things. Like, I want to do Mr. Rogers in Space. I want to remake I Love Lucy. I want to go on, I want to be on a dating show. And like, he just was going down the list. So I think I wrote down everything he said. I like recorded all of those conversations um, and kind of just used that as like a springboard to make like a weekly topic discussion show um, that kind of checked all those boxes of like things that he wanted to do in a show or like always wanted to do in a show and um structured it around his life and really leaned into it being like a sincere attempt at like a mr rogers type uh television show so you i noticed that um you kind of had a lot of locations you went did you go to illinois to his his <laughs> his yeah. home house and everything yeah i mean like we how is we, that a that just seems like wild for like kind of an internet show to have a budget to fly you guys to chicago and like look at his childhood home and then also go to area 54 and like you so what, what was it like traveling with date how many people were on the crew for that 
so that i mean that answers your question is is like there was no crew for it it was it was me directing and a lot of me directing was just trying to get david just to talk and stay on topic and stuff and carl feiler uh one of the producers that absolutely uh was filming so it was just the two of us so like we were kind of able to use the the budget towards like really we have we have one episode that never aired just because like we couldn't because like there was really not a lot to it but we also went to las vegas with leave a heart um what were you I don't doing think there he was doing a show there like because this was also simultaneous part so part of the reason too we were able to go to chicago was i think he was on tour at the time so he was already there so carl and i flew out there to shoot with him and see like his childhood home and all that stuff um and we followed him to vegas and we were we were trying to make like kind of like a concert film but like it, it just didn't really translate yes brent um so i have two things um one is a comment and then the next thing is a question um so i just realized liebe means love in german mm -hmm. so it's it is love heart it's interesting that it's it's love and heart is so the show could have been called i liebe i liebe david or it could have been called i heart david spelling it the way he's his last his name is spelled all right yeah. that's just the last thing about that my question is um david liebe heart is sort of someone i feel like is thought of as a character you know um and especially the way that I don't know, the small bits of them we see in Tim and Eric stuff and whatever else. Spending this much time with David, traveling with him, going to his childhood home and all that, did you start to understand him more as a human being? And what was that like? What did you learn about him? And uh, yeah, he became more real. Did he become more real to you? Yeah, I mean, so that was that was also kind of the aim of the show because I mean, part of the reason why when I, when I got the job, I like was dreading that one the most was because I felt like it could have so easily become something really mean almost. And not that like, I, I don't think like any of the stuff that Tim and Eric have done with him in the past is mean because he's always very much in on the joke. Like there's no bigger fan of Tim and Eric awesome show than David Liebehart. Like he can quote bits that he wasn't even in, but I was really worried that like spending that much time with him just because he is so like outlandish and is exactly who he is. Um, I was worried it was going to feel like exploitive or like weird or something. Um, so the, the goal of the show and me as the director of it was to really humanize him because because up until that point he was just this guy that you know was in a bunch of re really funny sketches that I liked when I was a stoner in college and like the weird old man that comes to the office and like people um and uh yeah I would say like he became really humanized to me like he he's honestly I mean people <laughs> you'll laugh but like he's he's be rapidly become one of my best friends like like we talk pretty frequently like even now even now yeah i mean we're we we we're taking a little break because we got in a we got in a big argument at the beginning of the pandemic um what was it but, about yeah well <sighs> he's never gonna hear this um <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to put an out i always i wanted to like produce an album for him um and we started putting something together and i had this like concept behind it that he seemed really into and then like the pandemic started and he started like really getting on my case about like wanting to create new fresh material and stuff and it's i mean the thing about david is like he's always thinking like 30 projects and personal projects like ahead of time so it gets really exhausting when you're working on one and you, and it's already like hard enough. So I, uh, we were recording a song one day and he was being very rude to me, uh, was getting my name wrong and like 
getting my pronouns wrong and stuff. And I, I kind of took a moment and said, you know, David, I'm kind of doing you a favor by helping you put this album together. And you're being a little bit of an asshole. And he erupted like, like, I, how dare you call me an asshole? I am a veteran and like uh, the pandemic's going on. And, and I was just trying to explain him like, you know, I'm just, I'm helping you and you're being like really, you're being like a diva. <laughs> um, so he hung up on me. I decided to give him a couple days. Uh, and when I called him back, he was like, you know, I, I still need space. Um, and we've, we've since talked again a little bit, but, but not with the same frequency that we used to. We, we used to talk like practically two to three times a week. <laughs> like, he, cause he calls me, he calls me and I would just keep the phone on cause it's like funnier than like podcasts and stuff. Like, cause he'll just talk and talk. Yeah. And talk he just kind of goes and goes. Yeah. Was that blow up the most human moment you experienced from him? No, you know what the most human moment I experienced with David was? I mean, that was a pretty human moment because it was, it was probably the first time that I was ever like, oh, wow, I, I really hurt David Liebehart's feelings. And that made me feel like horrible because, I mean, I, I, in a way that might be like infantilizing, I almost think of him as like a kid and like simultaneously like a grandparent because he's like in his 60s. Um, so I felt horrible. But the most human moment with him was actually uh, after we shot, because we had some stuff we shot in a, on a soundstage for his show. After we shot those, those segments, I was driving him home and it was really late at night and he was just sitting there and he just sighed. And it was weird because it felt like the wall had been taken down because he was just like, you know, how cool is it that two, two, two guys like you and me, we get to we get to just be artists and work for for Tim and Eric. How cool is that? It was just like this really like cute, sweet moment of gratitude from him that like was like, you know, he wasn't burping, he wasn't eating like <laughs> weird sausage. It was just like, oh, this is like like, oh, you're capable of, of being a normal dude. It was it's honestly one of my favorite memories of all time. Yeah, that is rare because he's usually complaining and feeling like he's being shafted or somehow you know yeah yeah Yeah, no i mean it's it was i i mean i the response to that show was pretty cool because like i think it it definitely introduced um tim and eric fans to to me because i was i was in it and i i also think just like since like style wise it was very different from a lot of the stuff tim and eric have, have done like it was it was a really awesome rewarding experience that i would totally do again if adult swim ever gave us money to do it but at the same time it was such a pain in the ass to make for that reason was that the he, was that the hardest show of of the four or five you did four yeah i would say uh of the four that was that was the most the most challenging but i think we all knew that from the beginning it was also the most challenging because i think you know like Tim and Eric were really excited about it. Like once they saw what I was doing with it. So they kind of gave me the space to just like really make it good. Um, so it, it, it was also like the longest we were working on that one for like well over six months. It was a really fucked up headspace to be in for six months. Yeah. I, I mean, I went on tour with him when he joined us on tour once and That's why I wanted to ask you, because like, <laughs> what is that? What is that like? Because I mean, just just even like, I like, tr- what was that like? <laughs> well, I mean, it was him I'm, and James I'm, Call were on our tour bus, and I can't even believe that that even happened. Brent, we lost your video. No, I know. I'll be I'll be right back. Carry on, carry on. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing you guys though. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was difficult. That was, that was why I had to ask you because like, how could you, <laughs> I mean, I, I was in a, in a group of people that I can kind of hide from him and stuff. And whereas you were more like one-on-one with him. Yeah. But there is this funny story that maybe we told before, but 
we were like, I think we got a flat tire on our tour bus in like Arizona. And he insisted on, do you know what prickly pears are? <laughs> I know this story, but yeah, yeah, so yeah I know like, what prickly pears are. These cactuses, <laughs> these cactuses bloom these fruit that are called prickly pears, these red like flower, they're not flowers, they're like a bulb. It looks like a fruit. And he was like, oh, we got to get some prickly pears. We got to get some prickly pears. And he just kept saying, we got it, we got it. And then he like collected all these prickly pears, just like from someone's yard even. It wasn't even like a cactus in a public area. He just like went into someone's yard and got them and put them in like a, a paper bag or something. And he kept telling us that, you know, like he was trying to show us how, how yummy these things are. None of us ate any of them, but he, he ate the prickly pears and then like uh, almost immediately was just puking on the bus from the <laughs> prickly pears. It was just so funny because first he was just driving us crazy about these prickly pears and then he like eats them and then barfs immediately. It was, it was perfect, but yeah. Yeah. There's often, I, I mean, like I really found with him, it's like, the moments with him that are really funny usually have like they come in like three waves of like it's not just oh he like is gonna annoy you for 15 minutes about getting prickly pears he's also gonna steal them from a neighbor's yard and puke everywhere after yeah he's done. yeah he's the funniest he's the funniest dude i think i've ever met like nobody really i i like he makes me laugh more than anybody um, just out of curiosity, you know how he became one of your best friends or whatever? <laughs> Did yeah. you confide in him stuff about yourself and get really intimate as far as just, you know, I don't know, and vulnerable with him? It, you know, is, did it get to that level? So I, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, I've I've had people tell me that I'm full of shit for saying this, but like I genuinely believe it was the only reason we were able to get what we got. Like I really had no boundaries with him while we were filming. Like he, I I told him everything because uh, I wanted him to to be open with me because like he he is like talkative and like you know we'll we'll talk your ear off even if you're like a stranger. But there's a very short loop of things that he has up here so like and I wanted to know about his childhood I wanted to know like where he was actually from I wanted like the gritty details about you know his his abduction and stuff so I mean part of my process was <laughs> what a fucking obnoxious word um, <laughs> but part of my process was to really like let him know that like there were no walls and like no boundaries and that he could tell me any I could tell him anything he could tell me anything and that I also wasn't gonna like shame him or make fun of him because that was something early on that I think he was very very su like surprisingly concerned about because like again like I don't feel like Tim and Eric have ever exploited him but like I have a real problem with like a lot of the stuff some of the fans have shot with him from time to time um so yeah i mean he knew i mean he was one of the first like people like i told i was trans uh just because that was the other thing it's like i didn't know david liebehart identified as bisexual until we worked on that show and like talking about our our queerness together and stuff like so yeah to answer your question we both know way too much about each other and that's also probably why we had a falling out <laughs> interesting yeah the closer you get the the weirder or the the more the freakier it gets the, yeah i don't know the closer you get to someone the more likely that you're going to get into a big argument or something you know yeah did you ever have that with with any of the like tim and eric people doug like like because like i know like like clark ranking got really close with james qual um did you have any any that you sort of latched on to? No. I liked James more than David, just because David was just maybe unintentionally, but he was just kind of a an annoying person and kind of a jerk sometimes. He would always call me Elton John, and I'd be like, don't call me that. And then he would just keep calling like me that. I mean, everyone loved calling, it. it was, he should be calling was, you Gordon Ramsay or something like that. Everyone thought it was funny. 
so I didn't really get, I didn't really get upset. I just kind of like wanted to, I just kind of kept my distance. I mean, also yeah. I was an editor. I wasn't like directing, you know, I was on stage with him. So I had, I did have to work with him. I was doing his music cues on the, on the tour, but yeah, I mean, not really, not really with, with, with the people that aren't directly the crew. Yeah. Right. Um, but did did David ever like try to get sexual or anything? Because <laughs> I know he's kind of a up for so, whatever and hits on everybody kind of thing. And that's what I was trying to stay away from, actually. That yeah, Not I mean anything weird. He okay. So there's this is like kind of a two part question because when I was working on the show, I was I was still closeted as as a trans woman but i had i had was already out as like queer or whatever and i had already been on like hormones for like six months at that point so like i was rapidly becoming just like a very soft looking in his eyes boy <laughs> um, like i was very um what we would call a twink at that point and he there were a couple times where he he I could tell he was kind of getting a crush a little bit. But then, you know, when he found out I was a girl, wanted nothing to do with me in that regard anymore. So it was kind of a relief. <laughs> Wait, why is <laughs> that? I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I I think it was I think it was cause he thought I was like a gay guy and that was more probably just more aesthetically appealing to him than than a trans woman um i also think at that point i had made it clear to him that you know it actually made me uncomfortable when he like complimented how pretty my eyes looked and stuff so he probably also just knew to keep his keep his distance interesting so but yeah I, he he has like <laughs> a crush on a few a few of the abso boys he's he he was very fond of you doug <laughs> <laughs> he must be, uh, interesting yeah <laughs> that's interesting too yeah did you, he ever hit on you doug no not really he just sort of he just always wants something you know he always like it's funny he'll go to the office and then there'll be some leftover food and he'll like Oh really? I can have this, and he takes it all, and he's like, and then he'll kind of complain, like, "Don't you have any better chips?" Or you know, he's like, "Don't you have any hot French fries?" I don't know. It's like yeah. some stuff like that, where he's like, you give him something, and then you like, kind of complain and like want more than than what you offer. Did he, <laughs> it's just kind of he, funny, really. It's just funny. But what, did he fight in the Go Persian Gulf War or what? Oh yeah. So how, his veterans. What is that? I can't, so that was something I was never able to lock down because he, he has told me combat stories, but he also, and like, I was prepared to do like a whole, you know, like war reenactment and stuff. And he, but like on the day when we were like shooting his monologues, he actually revealed that he went through basic training and, uh, they like gave him like an honorable discharge shortly after. So I think, I think he was in the army or, or no, he was uh, in the Navy. That was. Yeah. He was in the Navy. He, he told us some, some wild stories about that too, which who knows if any of these are true. Did he tell you any of his sexual Navy he told stories? Me, yeah. Gre those, the, <laughs> yeah. Grease the trolley pole. I think that's might be based on his, yeah his Navy. <laughs> story <laughs> yeah I, I i mean that could also be my my interpretation of those was him maybe getting some timelines confused too because he he also seemed to have been pretty active in the nightlife the hollywood nightlife scene when in the 70s um his stories to tell i will not get into them but i think he might have maybe confused his military time with some of the times where he was painting murals and bathhouses and stuff like that so I, we don't have to talk about david the whole show but i, I know mean, this is, it this is, is good, like a it's good stuff but yeah, it's, it's um, like a david but let me ask you this do you believe 
A, that he was abducted, and B, do you believe in aliens? So, okay. I, I believe that he had, I believe that he had a UFO and abduction experience. Whether that means he was sucked up into a flying saucer and they shoved a tube up his nose, or it means he went through some sort of like crazy psychedelic trip of some sort. I mean, either way, something happened when he was, when he was a kid that really does sound like an abduction story, like an, a, a pretty substantial, and it's never, the story's never changed. So like, he definitely believes it. Um, I would say I believe him. And I, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty like witchy and kind of wooey <laughs> um, and new agey. And I've, I've always, you know, I've had a few paranormal experiences myself. So I've always been open to the idea of UFOs, I would say like hanging out with Liebehart all the time really made me a believer, especially when we went to Area 51 because like, I, I thought like going to Area 51 was just gonna be like, we'd drive up to the gate, we'd film a segment and then we'd be on our way. But like, it was, I was like, it was such a bizarre experience. Like it was like, as we were approaching as we got closer and closer to the base, I was getting nauseous. We were all getting nauseous. Um, and we were hearing ringing in our ears. Really? Uh, yeah, it was, it was wild. Like, I, I'm fairly certain they have some sort of, like, um, sonic something to, like, keep people away. Um, so there was just, like, something really, like, energetically fucked um, about, about that experience that made me a pretty hardcore believer. And just, like... I don't know, like, Carl and I all the time say, like, David Liebehart was, like, an angel sent by God to test us, and I really genuinely feel, like, whether it's aliens or, like, something sort of magic-y about David, like, there is something very otherworldly about that dude, just because even the way he thinks about time is so weird. Like, he lent, he lent Carl, I watched this happen once, he lent Carl a book about Robin Williams, and uh or no he he's he asked carl would you like to borrow my book about robin williams he said yeah sure an hour later david hands him this book that appeared i don't know where he got the book from two hours later he asked carl if he's read the book yet so like time and space does not exist for this man <laughs> so whether that's from the touch of extraterrestrials or something else um i i i'm kind of a true believer when it comes to that stuff so what was, you said you had some kind of uh, paranormal experiences. Can you talk yeah. about that? Uh, I mean, a lot of it is, is like very much just like feeling stuff. Like I was, I, I, I grew up, um, my grandfather had a farm when we were growing up and it was like right by a cemetery. And I used where, to see. Where like, was this? In uh, Frankfurt, Illinois. Um. I forgot that you're from Illinois too. Yeah, I just remembered you are too. Wait, wait, you're from the north side though, right? I'm from the southwest suburbs, but then I lived in Chicago for a while. Which which one are you from? Darien, but no one knows what that is, but Downers Grove is where I went to high school. I know what Darien is. I used to play soccer in Darien. Um, but yeah, my, my grandfather's farm was in Frankfort, Illinois, and they had, there was, there, I used to see like, lights and orbs and like hear shit over there all the time the big one and i actually found a tape of this and i swear this wasn't just the patreon plug um but i i saw that you and uh the office hours boys were doing your cringe tapes and i found some tapes of me from when i was 19 and one of them has a paranormal experience on it where i i saw a ghost in my like chicago apartment basement i saw like this this face in the basement oh my god we gotta, we gotta release the tapes gotta release Wait, the tape you got it on tape i got i got it moments after on on like audio tape of of me describing the experience I see. Um, and that's available on my patreon patreon.com slash vera 22 plug it up but maybe it'll be behind maybe i'll take it from out behind the paywall someday we'll see it, you went down to the basement and you saw a face I saw a face. I saw a face in the darkness. And this was like, I mean, Doug, you lived in Chicago. Like, there's like 
all those weird old buildings like with weird architecture like i lived in this this house on in in up or it was a three flat in uptown but i'm fairly certain it used to be like a three-story house because it was like divided in two it was like very clearly like one side was like the owner's side and one side was the servant's side and in the basement and there were still like remnants of this there were like these fucking stables but like horse stables but the weird thing about these stables was they locked from the inside so like why why the hell would a so there was just bad vibes in that basement anyway and i think we were down there when i don't remember what i was down there for with my roommates but we were moving some i was like moving something over and we heard something like on the other side of the room and then like a little piece of metal flew up from where we were standing um at first i thought it was a dime but when we went back down there later there was no dime i think it was just like a weird little chunk of metal and then we both looked up my roommate at the time saw this too and we saw a face in in the darkness i wish i had more i mean that's that's cool i wish i had more paranormal experiences i wish i had any I i've never had a single one i mean i've had i'm a, i've I had i've had definitely that. weird feelings and you know moments that i feel um kind of trippy or something but like nothing i could really describe you know nothing i've s- said i saw something or things like that you know i just hey doug yeah since you don't since you haven't had a paranormal experience are you does that make you a non-believer or what no just more of agnostic about it i guess uh-huh. you know i'm not like yeah i'm not one way or the other i'm i'm I, you know i don't want to say one way or the other about things that i can't explain you know what i'm saying that and i've said it before even about like politics i don't want to be like super opinionated about things that i'm not an expert on or Mm -hmm. have firsthand experience with um but god i wish there were more people like that (laughs) you know what i mean i mean i at first i try to when i see something like The George Floyd thing, for example, I do want to like speak up and be like, you know, this is, I'm, I'm with this black lives matter movement, which I did, but I also don't want to like go to get too opinionated about it because it's a big complicated, like mess, you know, that I, it's, it's hard to, I'm not an expert on it. That's all, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's also, it's like, it's, it's not, uh, it's hard. To, it's like stuff like that specifically is like very hard to talk about, especially like if you're coming from like a comedy place, like, I don't know, like, I, right. I, I, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't think like it's, it needs to be like everybody's job to constantly be like espousing. Yeah. Yeah. The I think correct there's, opinion yeah. or the wrong opinion. Like, right. Yeah. There's too much. There's. Yeah, exactly. Not not everybody needs to chime in on every topic. Like I want to, I'd rather like listen to the experts. That's what I'm doing now. I'm just like, and that's, you know, that's my, the same thing with like ghosts and UFOs and stuff. Like I'm open to hearing open the to stories. Abducted. I'm open to it, but I'm not, I'm not like a hardcore atheist either. Like, do you want to get yeah. touched by an alien? <laughs> I Are sometimes I do I do hear sp- spooky stories and I get creeped out. I like I like it, but you, know. you want to get probed? <laughs> you know what happened yesterday? I I went in my kitchen and I have this giant butcher knife and it was sitting on my counter. And I know it's not I know I just I chopped my finger the other day. It was it not with a butcher in. it was not a butcher knife, it was a machete. It was like this machete that Johnny gave me this, but this big ass knife, but I didn't, I didn't use that to chop my salad. It was like a regular like chef's knife. But then yesterday I went in my kitchen to like, whatever, to get a something. And I noticed the, the machete was on my counter and I got freaked out. I was like, I don't know why this is there. 
did somebody break in my house and put it there to like send a message of like, you got to watch out. So I got freaked out. Yeah, that sounds, I would not. So I took that knife that. and I hit it. I hit it. <laughs> to, that's, that's how freaked out I got. I'm like, I must've just was looking at it or I don't know why it was there. Uh, the, how much of that story was true that you told earlier? Which Vera didn't hear. Oh, uh, Vera didn't hear this, but no, it's true. I chopped, I chopped uh, the tip of my finger off and with the machete. No, with a with a, a regular chef's knife. Got it. You know, okay, your, so your, that was all your classic you, your kitchen knife. That's like, and you really did go to the the doctors. I mean, he yes, went I went. <laughs> I went to urgent care. Why are and, you questioning the validity of his? Well, because it was mixed in with some fictional aspects of it. Yeah, I, I turned it into an ad. I turned it into an ad, but <laughs> let me ask you uh, one. It's one all last true, question. and was it's the all... doctor the most beautiful doctor you'd ever seen? That part true. She was very attractive, actually, and she was like really nice to me. But no, she wasn't. We, we, she was not. Well, there was nothing like. I know that there was. <laughs> that no part hanky, was fake, obviously. There, there's no hanky panky going no, on. No, no hanky panky with the doctor. But but <laughs> she she was the most beautiful doctor you ever seen well i mean she's up there all right she's up there okay look put it this way i'm gonna be getting my other finger hurt soon so i can pay her a visit <laughs> you, what a, you know what, what a funny idea for a romantic comedy where so, uh, someone kind of starts hurting themselves so they can go to the doctor i know i know with, you know dude i've or, come up or, with so many great movie ideas during this quarantine like i wish i was good at writing because i have the i have great premises i should just pick pitch ideas to like writers and be like all right it's a rom-com it's about a guy that keeps hurting himself so he can see this doctor or not just even hurting himself but maybe even trying trying to get sick or trying to get different diseases or something just so right. that you know he can go to the doctor i mean that's a great rom-com idea it really is. And then is. what happens? Like eventually. No, eventually it goes it to the extreme where he's missing limbs and it's like <laughs> hardcore. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but then in the end, it turns out that she, the doctor gets a terminal illness and she ends up being the one who dies or something. I don't know. So it's more like, that's not really like a romantic comedy. That sounds like the notebook or something. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not a romantic comedy. Maybe, maybe it's, it starts as a romantic comedy and then it just becomes a, just a, romantic drama you know it turns into one of those like hardcore like tears who's that who's that director from like norway or lars van trier <laughs> lars van trier. it turns into like a lars van trier <laughs> film gone, yeah. gone. he's done it he's dangerous <laughs> too, by the way <laughs> i don't think i've seen any of his movies because my brothers have a uh, they have these fun this funny video out right now called surfers episode one check it out but it, it's there's a Lars von Trier. Uh, Lars von Trier. You haven't seen any von Trier? I think I've seen one or two, but a lot of them. I don't know if I'm ever in the mood for a Lars von yeah. Trier. Yeah, like, they're not the happiest of movies. You know, putting your food. yeah, like I, I'm I, I like I don't need happy movies, but I don't want right. something that's just so bleak. Like well, I don't no, want to I don't want to wallow in bleakness for two hours. You know, I describe his movies as feel bad movies. Yeah, a lot yeah. of his movies, at least, feel bad movies. Oh, if you want to, if you want to go to see a, a feel bad movie, you know, with with maybe uh, an ex that you have resentment towards, then you know. Have you ever seen the movies by Mike Lee? No, who's that? Yeah. That sounds familiar. Now he makes some bleak movies that are like excellent. That I they're they're right on the line of bleak and not just feel bad. You know, they're. They're kind of feel bad, but they're like so excellent. Uh, this one called Naked. Yeah, which I that's with uh, David Flu David Thewlis stars in that. David Thewlis, yeah. Check check out Naked. He's got some, that one. It's like fucked up, but it's like it is. Yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah, there's it's good. It's I'll check it out. I like I like movies that make me feel bad. Oh <laughs> really? It, yeah, especially like well, see, I've, there's, during this yeah. pandemic, I've I've like. I, I watched Antichrist, uh, speaking of Don Trier, like um, a couple weeks into the pandemic. And I don't know. Should I watch that? It's fucked. It's fucking intense. It's really confusing. You've seen that one, right, Brent? No, 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 I haven't. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's got really good performances. Like Willem Dafoe's really good in it. 
but there's some like hardcore like genital mutilation in it and like there's like a talking animal it's it's fucked up yeah i don't want to watch that there's certain (laughs) movies here's the thing i don't mind uh feeling sad or something in a movie but i don't really like i don't love when movies just are they are purposely designed there's just things that happen to make you feel bad you know or it's just uh, yeah something like that i don't know that's not it, I, i'm not even criticizing those movies it's just that's not what i like to to watch you know i like to laugh and i like to think and i do like to feel sad if it's in a more it, if it's a harder to earn way or something like that if that makes sense you know? brent i watched that movie that jed um recommended, recommended lake mungo oh yeah i checked it out yeah yeah that's all you have to say about i'm it. not blown away by it it's in, it's very interesting and very unique it's a very unique film um it it's a one of these found footage movies anyway back to, vera. Back to vera what vera, have you been you... vera what do you, what kind of projects i know you're working on a project and you you want to talk about that what's that project Sure. Um, I'm making a feature film called The People's Joker uh, that Mm. uses uh, footage from the Joker movie that came out last year um, and a bunch of other Jokers of of Joker's past um, and just like a a handful of other movies. And I'm I'm making an entirely new feature-length story using that footage and additional footage and animation and stuff that I'm, that I'm going to be making. And uh, it's kind of a a very heavily autobiographical uh, movie about uh, working in comedy and being a trans woman and sort of the last couple years of my life. Wait a second. It's, is it, is it autobiographical film? Yeah, I wrote I wrote an entirely new script with uh, my friend Brie LaRose, who's a writer from like Lady Dynamite and Arrested Development, and um, it's it's based off of my life. Like I I used to when I was a kid. Not a lot of people know this, but I was like kind of like a failed child actor, and I was doing comedy like when I was like from like the time I was like thirteen to like my early 20s i was doing a lot of improv and and stand up and stuff and i was wait wait what you did stand up as a kid yeah yeah as, a, as yeah when i like from like the time i was like 16 to like 23 i want to hear Whoa. some jokes some wait, early jokes wait, wait, and where in <laughs> you'll chicago? hear them in the movie <laughs> wait in, in, in illinois yeah in chicago um huh and you but did it, acting in in chicago you didn't do anything in los angeles no, well, when I moved out here, because like I, I, I always wanted to make movies and television. Um, and when I moved out here, I was gonna kind of try to keep the performance thing going because I like acting a lot, and I and I do like performing live comedy. But when I came out here, I don't know. Like I feel like there's like at least three other <laughs> people have <laughs> saying this. For, for other like like I, I thought the scene I thought the comedy scene out here was really bad like I, I just it was not for me like in Chicago it felt very supportive and I think a lot of that was just because I'd been doing it for a while and knew a lot of people but out here particularly stand up I was just like oh I don't want to do this because like I also didn't want to be a stand up comedian for my career like it was just something I enjoyed doing and I noticed that a lot of people out here were doing it in that way and then like as far as the improv stuff goes, like, it was. I got to fucking do, like, UCB or something. Well, you went to ASCAD, and you thought, I can't even touch that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just going to let them do their thing. You know, let them do – let the pros handle it. Yeah, I mean, really, no, it's – the. I mean, the, the – the, it's something that I really kind of explore in this film, like, because for the last – several years i've been kind of just like helping tell other people's stories which has been great because i've like learned a lot on how to like make a television show and stuff like that but like i just didn't really have much to say creatively on my own because i it it 
it took me so long to figure out who I was. And once I started to finally figure out who I was, I was like actually able to start doing performance and writing and stuff like that in a way that was authentic. Cause I think that was really what it was. I think it was partially those like external factors that I mentioned when I moved to LA, but it was also just like, I moved to LA. I was like a fucking like drug addict. I was like still deeply closeted. I was, I didn't know if I went on stage, I wouldn't even have known what to talk about because it would have been inauthentic because I didn't know who I was. It Can takes I, it takes uh, some of us a long time to figure out who we are. I'm still figuring it out. I'm st I'm still refining. I think most people, hopefully, keep refining them themselves. You know, throughout so. their lives. There now, should not. Yeah, there should never be like a finish line. For, yeah, for there's. Real. It's always a you know that's that's how I think. But I, now I, you I were you were on the podcast before. Um, for a route about exactly four years ago because I, I remember was it was like a week after trump got elected wow was it four years ago already yeah i was thinking about that i couldn't believe it that's but it was, crazy yeah it was right after i can't believe that the election and since then you've you've gone through a transformation and do you feel like you're the more who you are now totally I yeah totally i mean like it's still it's funny because I'm like relieved at how you asked that question because <laughs> normally I feel like people, I don't know. It's like I said, like, I don't think there should be like a finish line for growth. And I feel like people often ask me like, um, as if like there's some sort of like end date to like finding, you know, like really knowing what my identity is. Um, cause I feel like I'm still learning a lot about myself in that regard, especially with in quarantine, just because, I'm alone in this house. Um, but yeah, I mean, long story short, too late. I am so much happier than I was. Uh, and I, I mean, like, it's, it's like things, little things like, um, I mean, big things like being more comfortable in my body, but just, yeah, I don't know everything. Like, like it's, I, it's been, I keep telling people this, like, it's been such a difficult year, but it was, it's definitely not been the worst year of my life because I'm, I'm finally being myself. And, um, yeah, it's really, I've, 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 I, I feel very fortunate that I, cause I, I don't think I really could have waited any longer. And I was, I was in, I mean, like four years ago, I was in pretty bad shape. So like it, it was, it was good. How did you get out? How did you get yourself out of that? Sorry, but we'll go, go back to you in a second. But how, so you were, you said you were an addict. What were you, what were you on? I was, uh, I was, I was like a pill freak. I was like really into like, I used, I used to like being, um, basically to the point where I would just be about to fall asleep. So I was really into opiates, like hydrocodone. This four years ago? This was, uh, yeah, like, like I was still, I was still kind of battling some of that four years ago. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I never did heroin cause I'm afraid of needles and I don't like snorting things. Uh, thank God. But yeah, I was, I was like a painkiller addict. So you were kind of like trying to numb or just not trying to face yourself or something. Yeah. Or, you know? I mean, like, I think I was partially numbing myself, but I actually, I've spoken to a couple other trans women about this, uh, who went through similar issues. I think it was actually a way of connecting with my body because like it, like, I don't know, like I still remember the feeling of like having a shit ton of Vicodin in my system. It was like, like being in a, being under a warm blanket in a hot bath and like my mind was shut off and it, and I was able to just like actually sit there in my body and not freak out up here and like be, you know, like all over the place. Um, so I think it was a combination of like numbing myself and, and kind of like actually grounding myself. How did you dig yourself out? Um, you know, I, I really, the simple answer is I, I got a really, really good therapist. I, I like the best, cause I, I was in and out of therapy my entire life. Um, from the time I was a kid, cause I dealt with a ton of gender dysphoria when I was a kid and I was misdiagnosed as like everything under the sun. So like, I 
was on every medication. I was like, I would talk to like every single, like I've, I've seen so many bad therapists. There are just so many bad ones. And I finally found a good one and um, who really encouraged me to start writing again. Cause at that point in my life, I wasn't writing. So I started writing every single day and I, and I haven't really stopped since I write every single morning. Um, and, uh, what do you write? Sometimes, you know, it's just, it's just nonsense. It's just like, like processing. It's, it's not, it's not like for creative stuff. It's sort of like journaling. Yeah, it could, I mean, the, it could end up being creative stuff. I mean, like the people's joker is actually a lot of what is in there is from these like morning pages but really i mean like i know i know a lot of people that that do this it's just i mean because like i wake up i don't know about you but like i wake up and my mind is already like racing about three thousand things i need to do and probably like regretting some stuff that i did yesterday so it's really kind of just like a way to like clear the tape almost like no i i I, i've actually been practicing that a lot not i don't do it every day but i do I've heard this from many different like self-help kind of people and podcasts that like journaling every morning is like a good way to like start your day. It's, I don't, or it's a good thing mentally. So I do, I do have a coffee shop near me. That's, they have outdoor seating. I'll go there. That'll be like my morning little ritual. But um, yeah, that's, um, that's cool. That's, that's cool that that helped a lot. I, I'm not sure if it helps me, but I do kind of look forward to it. Maybe it does help me and I haven't really realized the benefits yet, but I do it. I try to like, um, I, I try to do, you know, uh, I'm, the word is escaping me, but I try to be consistent with things, <coughs> positive change, you know, things, especially during the quarantine. I've definitely like used this time to work on being better as a person you know i think i wish there was more of a trend you know i do too because it seems like i mean like i don't know like i think i i have like a lot of like younger people that like my stuff and i always like try to impart like totally let yourself feel sad and like feel grief and like all the feelings and stuff but like you can't like especially now now more than ever like we can't really be like self-destructive and a lot right. of people yeah like like it's 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 really sad and and hard to watch because I mean, the, yeah because yeah, like the way i see it is like there's a lot of bullshit in this world that we can't control that makes us upset we're all upset about politics trump corona the the protests all this stuff that you can't really control on an individual you can scream about it on twitter but what you can control is your own self you know you can your own choices so that's i think something that is a positive thing that people can focus on is like you can control your own choices and make positive choices in your life and try to change in that way but yeah and writing i think writing for me writing is like the only way i can actually suss out those choices and figure out what's what is like within my control and what's completely beyond my control. Cause I don't know, like I, I will let like something bad that happened to me personally affect me with the same weight as like something stupid Donald Trump does or like, and like, I have to, I can't, I obviously can't control what that fucking moron does, but like I can control my actions. And you can, I think can, yeah, you can control your reaction to it and, yeah. and say, you know what? I'm not going to be bothered by that anymore because he's going to do that shit. And there's nothing, nothing I can do would stop it, but, yeah. but it, it can bother me. And maybe that's what he wants or something, you know? Totally. That's what the haters want. They so want you to if you be really reactive. want change in this world, the change has to come from within. It's and so cliche. Note, it's let's so go, cliche. <laughs> let's go um, to the, uh, I do have some questions that I want to ask, but I'll save them for, because we're kind of going to wrap this up. Right? Um, Vera, do you mind? Um, we do like a bonus half hour um, or more I, after the main show. That's fine. For our Patreon uh, subscribers, which is optional for you, but we'd love to keep chatting um, if you want. Yeah. I'm we're going we're gonna to wrap up the main, the main episode right now. So, 
for y'all listeners out there, if you want to, you know, continue listening to our conversation with Vera. I got a better. burning question. I got and for, for as low as $2 there. a month, we are a cheap Patreon subscription. That's 50 cents an episode. I mean, it's recommended that you do the higher, maybe the next higher tier, but it's I mean, recommended. You know, like, it's recommended, but do whatever you want. You know? <laughs> Thank you to LouisvilleVeganFoods.com. Use the code word Poundcast for 20% off. And, and ch- check out that link on Instagram, on my Instagram account for uh, the, and then, and uh, Vera, do you, what, is there things that you, yeah, uh, uh, you, yeah, yeah. Plug, get, get your plugs back out here. Um, let me, sorry, I gotta get my chart. Um, I can be followed at, at Vera Drew. Oh, shit. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> that's, that's your handle. <laughs> your, your, your voice just, can you hear me now? We can still yeah. hear you. Okay. Um, but it sounds different. Oh, uh, let me. Oh, there you okay. go. There you go. For now? Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Hell no. Hell no. Hold on. Let me just make sure it's. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> How about this drive by? I'm sorry, guys. That's all right. <laughs> I, I'm not good at technology. Like, people think I am. I'm, I'm a good editor, but this fucking like digital world we live in now. I f- yeah, like you're better with reel to reel. Yeah, yeah. Editing, right? no. um, analog. We should have done an analog chat on on landlines. Right. We um, should do a, we should do a podcast called Landlines where we just talk on landlines and record it into a tape deck. I'm probably the only one here who has a landline. You still don't have a cell phone? Right. <laughs> I don't, that, that sounded like I had a lot of judgment in my voice. I actually see that as like a good quality. I, th- I think is. that's really impressive. It is, thanks. Okay, well, look, um, um, let, let's plugs, hear, uh, so. plug, plug us your plugs and then we go to the, um, the After Dark segment. And yeah, I got uh, some questions. I can be followed at veradrew22 on Instagram and, 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 uh, I can be followed at Vera Drew 22 on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, also, if you get the chance, uh, please visit the People's Joker. Oh, when's this going to drop? Um, um, this week. When, this week. Uh, Friday, Friday officially, but the After Dark people get, I'm not sorry, the Patreon people get it to, on Wednesday. They get the early access. Okay. Uh, I have a GoFundMe right now for my film, The People's Joker. Um, so if you, I, there, uh, there's a lot of good places that you can put your money right now. So if it's not in your means or you don't want to, totally fine. But peoplesjoker.com, uh, help me make this movie. It's really great. You'll be a part of something weird. Doug's make, making a song for it. Heidecker's in it. Uh, Vic's editing a segment. Uh, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. I think really, a really cool project. All right. And thank you very, Drew. And for everyone else, we'll see you next week Bye. on the Poundcast. Poundcast. But- oh, company probably got their wires all tangled up. Go on up and straighten out the mess. Ah, ah. Wait a minute. What am I doing? You know I get dizzy in high places. You're dizzy in low places. Get up Welcome there. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Gee, did it hurt? No. Does this? Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Now I don't want any more arguments out of you.
Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. To the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the Poundcast. Welcome to the